Beloved, let us love one another. We love because God first loved us. Good morning. I am the Reverend Dr. Campbell Hackett. On behalf of the Congregation of Kirkwood Presbyterian Church in Springfield, Virginia, I'd like to welcome you to this service of worship. We're delighted you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Whether you're a member or a visitor, we hope you'll feel embraced by the love of Christ Jesus as we worship today. If you are with us for the first time, please go to our website, kirkwoodpres.com. There you'll find a link to download a copy of this week's bulletin, though we'll also be displaying it as we go along. Also on the website, there's a new visitor form where you can tell us about yourself. If you choose to give us an email address, we'll add you to our email list and you'll get an email each week to keep you up to date with the life of this congregation. Whether you're joining us this morning through Facebook or YouTube, please consider adding a note in the comments section to let us know that you're here and to greet your fellow worshipers. Before we begin, I have a few important announcements. Today, immediately following worship, we'll gather in what we call the virtual narthex for a time of fellowship. We also hold a fellowship gathering every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. The link to join Wednesday's fellowship is sent out on Wednesdays. The link for today's fellowship is sent out in our weekly email, This Week at Kirkwood, that is sent each Thursday. If you're not already on our email list and would like to be added, just send an email to office.manager at kirkwoodprez.com. Also, graduation season is almost here. If you or a family member has a graduation this year, whether from high school, college, or graduate school, including mid-year graduations from last December, please let us know. Send your graduate's name, institution, major and minor, phone number, and email to Ann at office.manager at kirkwoodprez.com. Please get these in by Monday, May 24th, if possible. Also this afternoon, from 4 to 4.30 p.m., all preschool and elementary age children are invited to join us for Kirkwood story time. Grandparents are encouraged to invite their grandchildren to join us too. All are welcome. We'll have a brief story followed by fun activities and fellowship. And now with joy in our hearts, let us prepare to worship God. life. Seek us out, O God, and take us to the water. In the word of God, the good news gives light. Seek us out, O God, and fill us with your understanding. In the bread and the wine, the body of our Savior nourishes everyone. Seek us out, O God, and give us yourself. Here is the water of life, the word that feeds the food of eternity. Come and praise the vine that gives all goodness.
Let us join in the gathering prayer. Wondrous vine grower, you make all things new in water and word, feeding your people with love, joy and peace. Lead us today and every day to the font of new beginnings. Teach us to love what you have commanded and to prune what does not nourish your creation. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us join in singing hymn number 703, Jesus, thy boundless love to me. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess to God and to one another our failure to love our neighbor. God of mercy, we confess that we have not borne the fruit of the Spirit. We have not loved others as you have loved us. We have denied the promises of baptism and cut ourselves off from you. Forgive us, restore us, that we may abide in your love and live out your mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You have already been cleansed by the word that God has spoken to you. In baptism, God claims you and joins you to Christ as branches on a vine. Believe the promise given to you. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Sing out for joy, Christ.
Let us greet one another as we share the peace of Christ. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. 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 At this time, I invite the children to join me for the children's message. First, let's check in. Did anyone take my suggestion from last week? And memorize the 23rd Psalm? If you did, let me know. In today's Gospel reading from the book of John, Jesus explains the relationship between God, himself, and all Christians. He does this by comparing himself to a vine, comparing Christians, including us, to the branches on the vine, and by comparing God the Father to the gardener who takes care of the plant, that is the vine and its branches. In this example, Jesus talks about the gardener pruning the vine. Do you know what it means to prune? To prune a plant is to trim or cut it. A gardener may cut away dead or sick parts. They might have cut away healthy parts too, because it encourages the plant to grow more, that is to produce more flowers or more fruit. So pruning involves removing the extra or the unwanted parts of the plant. Now listen while I read a part of the parable. Jesus said, I am the vine and God, my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And he prunes every branch that does bear fruit so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. Remain connected to me and I will remain connected to you. Just like the vine and the branches are connected. I am the vine and you, that means us too, are the branches. If you've ever seen grapes or tomatoes growing, you know that they develop on a vine that sends out branches and the grapes or tomatoes hang from the branches. So there's an even thicker vine for real, but you can see this main bit, maybe we call that the vine. And then hanging off the vine are the branches and off the branches are the fruit. It may be easier to see on one where I've already picked all the fruit off. So you can see the main piece and then the branches and how they kind of tangle up inside each other sometimes. Sometimes the vine, that's the main thick part, can grow very long, up to even 50 feet long, which is the length of one and a half school buses. That would be a lot of grapes or tomatoes from just one vine. Jesus tells us that we are like the branches on the vine. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain connected to me and I to you, then you will make a lot of fruit. This scripture teaches us that when we make Jesus a part of our lives, we grow like branches on a beautiful vine and we create yummy fruit. We do this by accepting God's love, studying the Bible, learning more about following Jesus, praying for guidance, and showing care to all people. We stay connected to Jesus through our church by participating in worship, story times, and food drives. We can learn to love, be gentle, be cheerful, be patient, and to help those who need our help. These are what the Bible calls the fruits of the Spirit. We can continue to grow in love and friendship when we stay connected to Jesus, like a branch that is connected to the vine, like a healthy vine that produces a lot of fruit. We can do a lot of good things by staying connected to Jesus, the vine. Let's pray. Jesus, the vine, keep us connected to you so we can produce your fruits to love, to be gentle and kind, to be cheerful, to be patient, and to help those who need help. Amen. At this time of offering, please remember you can mail contributions to the church. This will be displayed on your screen in a few seconds. But you can also use one of your pre-addressed pledge envelopes. It will be helpful if you write offering in the memo line on your check. You can also make online donations by clicking the green 
Give Now button on our homepage at www.kirkwoodpress.com. Offering what we have for the sake of others is a discipline of pruning, letting go of our possessions, our time, and even ourselves to extend the gospel witness into the world. Be generous in your ministry of giving. You need not to fear, you abide in the vine. O oh God, give your loving spirit to a world in need of comfort, making our many gifts one offering for the world. In the name of Jesus, Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to turn to the list of joys and concerns for this congregation, which you'll find on the final page of your bulletin. Take a moment now to quiet your mind and calm your heart as we prepare to offer our prayers to the one who loves and sustains us. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we bow before you this morning, mindful of all your great acts and grateful for the care you have given to us. In a world filled with conflict and challenge, hardship and hatred. You have blessed us with peace and security, abundance and love. You have drawn us into relationship with you and welcomed us to come before the throne of grace, bringing our praise, our concerns, and our deepest desires to you. You have promised to listen when we pray and we have confidence knowing that our risen Lord Jesus intercedes on our behalf. These are gifts beyond measure, offered freely to us irrespective of our worthiness. Grant us grace never to forget that, never to take your love for granted. Fill us with desire to pass your love along, to share it with each person we meet. Help us to see that we are connected one to another as branches joined to the one true vine, our Lord Jesus. Strengthen our connection that we may be nourished and enabled to bear fruit. And now trusting in that connection, we pray for those we know who need healing of body, mind, or spirit. 
Within our own circle, we lift up our friends Celia, Bob, Joanne, Claire, and Millie. And we pray also for those whose names we hold in our hearts and bring before you now in the silence. Hear our prayers, O God. Merciful God, we pray also for those we do not know. And this day, we are particularly aware of those affected by the COVID-19 virus, which has impacted the lives of your children all around the world. In this, as in so many other things, we have been fortunate. Most of us have been able to avoid infection, and those who have become ill have had access to good medical care. We know this is not the case for everyone. This morning, we pray especially for your people in India, where the healthcare system has been overwhelmed by the number of severe cases and the death toll is rising hourly. Make your presence known to them in their suffering and grief and show us ways we can help. God of grace, we pray for our nation and for all the nations of the world. Grant to our leaders the wisdom they need to govern honestly and fairly. Give them vision to see the best path and help them to practice love and compassion in every act of leadership. God, we thank you also for inspiring women and men to lead lives of service, including the members of our armed forces first responders, and healthcare workers. Be with and bless them and hold them safely in your hands. Spirit of God, we thank you for being with us through all the events of our lives, providing us comfort when we need it and celebrating along with us in seasons of joy. This week, we rejoice with Logan, who is celebrating a birthday. And Lord, we give you thanks for the church and for its witness through the ages. Grant that we might be worthy inheritors of that witness and that we may share your good news with a world that so desperately needs to hear it. We thank you also for those who have answered your call to carry that message of good news and hope to places and people far from home, including our friends serving you now as missionaries in Zambia and in Japan. God, we know that our prayers are hollow unless we also put them into action. By the blessing of your Holy Spirit, help us to live as we pray so that the world may come to faith in Jesus Christ and experience the joy of being branches on the vine, members of his body. We ask these things in his powerful name as we offer the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, that through your word we may be guided into the love of God for all the world. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 22 verses 25 through 31. Listen for the word of the Lord. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. 
to him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. The epistle reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe that the love God has for us God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is thus, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Here ends the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Love. Perhaps the most written about thing that there is, certainly the most sung about. If we heed the advice of the Beatles, then it's all we need. Love that is, love is all that we need. However, sorry to let you down, but the Beatles don't have it quite right. Shockingly, they haven't made it very far as theologians. Both of the New Testament passages for today, the reading from the Gospel of John and the epistle reading from 1 John involve love, God's love for us, our love for God, and our love 
for one another. 1 John can be viewed as a treatise, a treatise on love, an extended explanation of John 3.16. The passage from 1 John, though relatively short, has quite a lot to say. It makes the profound statement that God is love. Love begins with God, and love is the central truth of Christian faith. Love demonstrates or reveals who God is. God's love is made manifest, is revealed in the incarnation, in the being of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we most know God's love for us. The incarnation made God's love and grace visible. We cannot see God, but we can see what God has done in Jesus Christ. Moreover, because God loves us, we can love. Only as the recipients of God's gracious love can we have the ability to know love and therefore show love. We are called to love one another. In this sense, 1 John is explaining Jesus' new or greatest commandment, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The passage in 1 John points out also that there is no fear in love. There's also no hate in love. We cannot love God and hate our neighbors. If we love other people as God has loved us, there can be no exclusion, no insider versus outsider, no citizen versus alien no boundaries. If we look to Jesus as a model, his harshest criticisms were not of those who were impure or sinners, but those who were self-righteous, those who thought that they were better than others, those who thought that they were pure and were excluding others that they judged as impure, unholy, or untouchable. Jesus ate and conversed with and healed a motley crew, the sinners the tax collectors, the outcast, the unclean, the aliens, the women, the convicted, and others who lived on the fringes. We don't get to pick our neighbors. Our neighbors are all the other branches, all the other children of God. This includes our enemies. Like God, we are to love those who present as unlovable. Like God, we are to love those who don't respond to our love. It's easy to love those who return our love. It is much harder to love those who do not. Yet, we are commanded to love them too. We are commanded to love the unlovely, the unloving, the hateful, the spiteful, the angry, the hurtful, the hurting, and even our enemies. This passage defines love as much more than an emotion or affection, but as action. One must not simply feel or believe something, but demonstrate it, prove it, act on it, live into it, abide in it. Finally, this passage makes clear that God's love is not transactional. There is no quid pro quo. God's love does not depend on us. God's love is not condition, conditional upon our initiative or our invitation to God. God loves us, period. God loves us before we believe. God's love is not predicated on our worthiness. It's quite the opposite. God's love is what gives us worth. As William Sloan Coffin described it, God's love doesn't seek value. It creates it. It is not because we have value that we are loved, but because we are loved, we have value. God loves us just the way we are. God's love works to make us clean and whole again, but we need not be clean and whole as a prerequisite for receiving that love. God loves us first. That's a lot of theological points to take in from a small passage. 
But the long and the short of it is this. God is love. We know God's love through the life of Jesus. Not only are we able to love because God first loved us, but as disciples, we are called to love others. Our second reading for this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, is also about love. It is another of Jesus's I am parables. Last week, we studied Jesus's parable of the Good Shepherd. The other I am parables include, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. In all of these, Jesus uses a metaphor to reveal something about his identity and his mission. This week's passage is Jesus declaring, I am the vine and you are the branches. God is the farmer who tends to the vine. Just as the sheep are cared for by the good shepherd, so the vine gives nourishment to its branches. This metaphor is based on gardening. Now I have to come clean. I am not a gardener. I do not know the first thing about plants or helping plants grow. I have never pruned a plant. So <laughs> I know that we have some master gardeners in the congregation. So please let me know if my understanding or misunderstanding of gardening affects my theological insights in any way. But for those whose knowledge of gardening is closer to my own, which is basically non-existent, let me explain a few basic principles that'll help us understand Jesus's metaphor. First, the closer a branch is to the vine, the more nutrients that it gets. And therefore, the better the fruit it usually bears. Also, vines, like other plants, can sometimes get distracted Putting too many resources into growth, such as new branches, instead of blooms or fruit. Branches can also get tangled and can die or get diseased. Cutting off the dead branches certainly makes sense. However, sometimes the gardener cuts healthy branches in order to promote new growth and potentially more blooms and or fruit. Now that we have the basics of vine health down and basic pruning protocol, let's turn back to what Jesus is trying to teach us by using this metaphor. First of all, I want to note that this isn't a new metaphor for the Hebrew people. There are many references throughout the Old Testament to a vine as a metaphor for the relationship between God and the people of God. However, in all those instances, Israel is the vine. By stating that he, Jesus, is the vine, Jesus is doing several things. He's calling back to these Old Testament passages, identifying himself with Israel, and retooling the metaphor. Throughout the passage, Jesus uses the term abide. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. The word abide is used four more times in the next four verses. What does it mean to abide? It's a word that we don't use often. There are several definitions of abide. The most common in our everyday language is to accept or act in accordance with. For example, we might say, you must abide by the rules or abide by the judge's decision. Other meanings include to tolerate, to remain stable or fixed, to continue in place, to conform, to accept without objection, to reside, to dwell, to connect, to stay close to, to cling, to depend, to rely, to, re to last, to persevere, to endure, and to acquiesce. In this passage, abide denotes the state of being connected. There's a sense of remaining stable or continuing in place as well um, as lasting or enduring. But in this metaphor, the branches are rooted 
and the vine. And therefore, they're fixed in place. And yet, they're also expected to grow, to multiply, and bear fruit. So though they are fixed in place, they are not static or unchanging. How are we, like the branches, to abide in Jesus the vine? The key to abiding in abiding is keeping Jesus' commandments. To love God and to love our neighbor. When we abide, we stay connected to Jesus. When Jesus was sharing this with his disciples, he was preparing them to be without him. He knew that he would soon be crucified and resurrected and would ascend to heaven. His time with the disciples was drawing to a close, and he wanted to make sure that they knew how to stay connected to him and God, even though he was no longer physically present. Jesus wanted to reassure them, the disciples, and us too, that Jesus has not abandoned them or us. God continues to have a real presence in the world. To be a disciple of Christ means to stay connected to Christ and to other disciples. And how do we stay connected? Through love. Love of God and love of neighbor. The key to being a productive branch, one that bears fruit, is connection to the vine. That is, relationship to Jesus Christ, the vine, and to the community, the other branches. This idea of abiding or dwelling in the love of Christ. Ah, but what to make of pruning? Hmm. It makes sense that the, branch, that the branches that are dead should be removed. But what about cutting the branches that are healthy and are bearing fruit? That just doesn't seem right or fair. Moreover, pruning hurts. The healthy branch that is removed dies, and the part that remains is injured and must heal. Some have therefore taken this element of the metaphor to indicate that pruning is punishment. Bear fruit, be a good disciple, or you will be punished. But pruning happens to the good branches too. Not because they aren't doing well, but because by pruning them, they will do even better. That is, they will bear even more fruit. So it doesn't seem like the pruning should be viewed as a punishment. If we return to the central theme of our first reading, that God is love, then how can we interpret the pruning? Perhaps even if there's there is pruning, it is motivated by love and care, and not by punishment, retribution, or apathy. Pruning transforms the branches. However, it is change, and human beings find change hard. Even if we know that something is unhealthy and not good for us, it is still painful to cut away that which we have become attached to. As branches, it is not our job to judge the rest of the branches. We can't know what else, what's going on elsewhere on the vine. That is God's job. The farmer who tends the vine decides what is pruned and when. God may be pruning a branch because it's dead, or diseased, or underperforming, or for some reason known only to God. A branch may be performing well but God believes that it can perform even better. Or God has a different vision for this section of the vine. The point is, is that we are not to judge the other branches. Our job is simply to stay close to the vine and to love the rest of the branches. We abide in Jesus and he abides in us. We love our neighbors. It is up to the vine grower to assess the branches. When I look at these two passages together, I am reminded of the balance in a healthy spiritual life. It isn't solely about love, nor is it about good works, which I'm defining as love in action or a sign of love. But it is also about being in relationship, relationship to God and to neighbor. In the vine metaphor, it isn't 
just about being connected to the vine, but it's also about bearing good fruit. Likewise, it isn't just about the connection to God or just about the connection to others, but about both and in balance. Discipleship entails balancing this journey inward, that is, focusing on our relationship with God, our personal spirituality, our beliefs, our reflections on our actions, our morals. So balancing all that with the journey outward. The journey outward is that love in action, our relationship with all the other children of God, the other branches, the things that we do for the benefit of others and to worship God. If we focus on one half, either all personal piety or all social justice activism, then we are not whole. We need a balance between the two. Each enhances and feeds the other. We need to be active and contemplative. We need to love God and neighbor. We need to pause in silence to reflect, to pray, and to listen for God. And we need to literally feed our neighbors. We need to spend time in study of scripture, and we need to fight for the rights of the disenfranchised. The worship or love of God and the love of neighbor go hand in hand. Neither can replace the other or be complete without the other. Because we are commanded to love our neighbors, the church must not become inward directed. Because we are commanded to love our neighbors, individual Christians cannot go it alone. We, the branches, are a community. We must see ourselves as intimately entwined with others. Our well-being and theirs are connected. The Christian life is not a solitary life. It is the life of relationship, of staying connected to the vine, Jesus, and to the other branches. This is radically different from the society that we live in. The Christian community is characterized by interdependence, mutual respect, and the ongoing, ever-breaking-in presence of Christ. Finally, Jesus says that bearing fruit will reveal that a branch is a disciple. In this metaphor, what does it mean to bear fruit? Bearing fruit is spreading the love of God to neighbor. Fruit will look different for different people based on their gifts and talents and on their context, their time and place. God calls us to do different things. Our neighboring branches have different needs. What is the same, though, is that we are all called to abide in the vine, to abide in Jesus. We are to love God and neighbor, doing good works that is love in action for the right reasons. This is a sign of discipleship. This is God's call to each of us, to you and to me, to Kirkwood Presbyterian Church. Don't live in fear. Love Love God and love neighbor. Be confident in Christ's love. Be a disciple. Share your testimony and truth. Share God's love. Abide in Jesus, the true vine. Let us pray. Risen Lord, you are the true vine and we are the branches. By your spirit, produce the fruit of love, joy, peace, and patience in us for others to taste and enjoy. Keep us from hanging on to love for ourselves. Prune all selfishness from us and fill us with your love. Amen.
the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. All the ends of the earth turn to you and worship you, O Lord. The poor eat and they are satisfied. Those who seek you praise your name. Even those who sleep in the dust bow down before you. Therefore we praise you. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Christ is the true vine. And you, O oh God, are the vine grower. He is the vine and we are the branches. In Christ, we bear fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us love one another. For love is from you, O God. You are love. Fill us with your perfect love that casts out all fear, so that we may love all people just as you have first loved us. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Spirit, we bless you, God of glory, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Come to me and never be hungry. Believe in me and never thirst. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us join our voices in praising God as we sing hymn 611, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Go out with joy that you have been fed and healed, securely abiding as branches of the true vine. Go and tell the story of faith that is given to you by the one who never lets you go. Seek out those who abound with sacred questions and be ready to answer a mystery with love. As Jesus entered into human life, his life is still alive in you. The blessing of the Almighty God be upon you today and always. Amen.